the chance to meet you yet. My name is Alex, and I serve here as our communications director, and I'm so thankful to be able to, to be here and to share the word with you today. But um, happy belated Thanksgiving. I hope that you all just had a wonderful time together, and um, did you get your turkey, Phil? Did you get your turkey, Phil? I won't lie. I'll, I'll just confess from the very beginning. I could uh, t- not really take the turkey. If you want to take all the turkey, that would be fine. You can have all the turkey and you can have all the pumpkin pie that your little hearts desire because I don't want any of it. I really just want a shirt that says, I am here for the sides. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure that that's the very best part. I don't, I don't really love the turkey. I could take or leave the ham, um, and I think pumpkin pie has the consistency of baby food. So you can have all of that, and I will just take the sides, and it'll be great. So I have the amazing opportunity of speaking to you today, and I'm so thankful for Pastor Josh and for Angie and how they lead this church so well. And so on Monday, he said, do you need anything from me? And I said, well, my notes are almost finished. Do you want to read them? And he said, nope, I wouldn't have asked you if I didn't trust you. And so I hope to steward that trust really well this morning. And I was sharing with First Service that there's something that is nerve wracking about sharing the word of God because doing that well and simply being a vessel for what God wants to speak to his people, that's nerve wracking and, and that's a good thing. But at the same point in time, sometimes doing this and speaking to a large room of people one way is easier for me than speaking to you one-on-one two ways because my brain goes too fast in the moment of being with other people. And here we're just going to embrace my awkwardness. There, it's just a train wreck and we're all gonna be in my awkwardness together. It was, my girls were out there with me a couple of weeks ago and somebody said something to me and I just completely answered the wrong question. Like it was, I had never met this woman before in my life and I just see my girls just laughing hysterically at their mother and I'm like, yep, this is me. I can't go through the drive-thru and answer the guy who hands me my food correctly anytime. I know that the proper answer is, thank you so much, but I can't do that. It's all, all the time going to end up with, here's your food, enjoy. Oh yes, you too every single time. So here we're just gonna embrace my awkwardness and it's gonna be great. So, but before we get started in today's message, let's pray that he will just bless our time together and then we will get started this morning. God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to be used by you in this house this morning. I'm so thankful that I I believe that you have a word for your people. Lord, and so I just ask that you help me to step out of the way and let the words that you would have for them to shine through. Lord, I ask that you just soften hearts to the message that you have asked me to bring this morning and really just do an amazing work that is well more than whatever I could do on my own. Lord, we give it all to you and we're so thankful for everything that you are and everything that you've given us. And it's in your name that all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, last week, if you were here in the house, Pastor Josh spoke on the grace of God. And I've known this is a standalone message, and I've known what I was going to speak now for a little bit of time. And I said to him on Monday, I'm really excited because I feel like it piggybacks off of what you said last week. And it's really cool how God does that and lines all the things up. But last week he spoke on the grace of God and this week my message is entitled Framework. And each and every one of us was given a framework. We were built on a framework that God built you on purpose for a purpose. And that framework is the framework that is necessary to fulfill that purpose. And so each and every one of us is built just a little bit differently with something different in mind, a different calling in mind. And God has built us the way that he has for a reason. Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Living inside the framework of God has given us for our life the chance to live inside the will of God. And the will of God is where his grace is, the most strong. When we attempt to change or adjust that framework to one that suits our fancy in the moment, 
We're stepping outside of God's grace on our life. And we're clearing a path for disappointment, bitterness, resentment, maybe even towards God. And we're making a way for all of that to enter the picture. But why would we step away from this perfect framework that God has, has created for us? And I would submit to you that we don't do it all at once, not often. A lot of times we do it one step at a time. God has created for us this framework and we see somebody else's framework. And we see how God is using them in their life or we see how much better things seem to be for them in that moment and we think, that just must be a better plan. That framework just must be better. If I could change this piece about me to be more like that, God's gonna be able to use it more. He's gonna honor that, I know he will. And here in lies the issue because God didn't create that framework for us. He created that framework for somebody else. He pre created that framework for somebody else's calling, not yours. He created you on the framework that he did for you to fulfill your calling. And sometimes we look at somebody else's Instagram highlight reel and we decide that it's just so much better over here. It's just so much better in their life right now. It's just so much better if I could be more like them. And we look at that and we look at that highlight reel and we're like, I could just never measure up. Well, we don't take into account that they haven't shown us the behind the scenes stuff that they don't want anybody else to see. We only see just a small portion, the portion that they want the world to see. And, and we're privy to all the knowledge we have of the inner workings of every piece of our life. It's not apples to apples by any means. And this is not just social media and you can pick your poison on which one of those you are a part of or you're not a part of. We've been doing this forever. When we walk into the church sanctuary and somebody says, how you doing? We say, oh, I'm good, how are you? And that person that we're speaking to, they don't need all of the knowledge of what's going on in our life. They're not the person we're supposed to give that all to. There's no problem. But that person who receives that, so many times they look at our all togetherness and our togetherness and oh, they're so good. They've just got all of this together and if I, maybe if I do this like they've done it, God's gonna bless that and it's gonna be better. And the next thing we know, we've taken six steps to the right of the framework that God has for our life. And he's so graceful and so patient to meet us exactly where we are. We are never too far gone to outrun God's grace. And I'm so thankful for that because I've tried. But his grace is sufficient for us wherever we are. But inside the will of God, that's where his grace rests the most. That's where the, his grace rests on our lives the fullest. There's an old saying that says that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. But I would like to submit an addendum to you to that, that old saying. The grass is greener on the other side of the fence because that's where the manure is. We don't like to think about that. But how did the grass get green? The grass got green because they toiled in the soil that is their, their lawn. They did the work. They, they were in the moment. They met with God. They were, they were doing the work on their family and their marriage and their life. They were doing all this work in the soil that is their life. And what we're seeing is the fruits of that labor. And so in our microwave society, we, we want to get there to exactly where they are today, right now. No steps. Here we are. But we don't necessarily have a microwave God. We have a crockpot God. Because you do have a calling on your life. But to get to that calling that you have on your life, your character has to match that calling. Your character has to match. Because if God sits you in this place and says, here you are, you've arrived and the character that you have doesn't match the place where you are, God can't use you to the fullest potential that he would really love to. 
And so that's one reason. We, we have seen somebody else's framework, we like, that's just better, I'm gonna try that one instead. Another reason that I think that sometimes we really struggle to stand on our framework is that we have seen somebody else do it poorly in the past. And the, the framework that they stood on is so eerily similar to our own that we're terrified that stepping out in that framework and stepping forward in that framework is going to end us up in the exact same place that they were. And there's nothing biblical about that. The Bible says that the old man has passed away, the new man is here with Christ Jesus. So we are that new creation. God, Jesus paid the ultimate price for us to be able to be that new creation. But in our human brains, we get stuck in that. We get stuck in, if I'm too much like this person and I've seen it done poorly in the past, the idea of a generational curse comes into play. Well, this is just how it is for my family. It's just always been that way. There's always one in every generation. And they just, this is how it is. Can I submit to you that the framework isn't faulty? How it's been handled has been wrong. But the framework itself, it's not faulty. God gave that to you. He made you in his image. Psalm 139, it says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I, made, when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God has put you on that framework. The framework isn't faulty. Just because you saw somebody else mishandle the framework doesn't mean you shouldn't step into the fullness that God has for you and for your life. I'll give you an example. When I was a little girl, always, you're just like your father. Oh my gosh, she's just like her dad. Every single, there were so many times, I couldn't even name them all, of all the times that, it, oh, it's just like your dad. And we are. We were very much alike. I'm analytical and I wanna see the issues and things and let's see how we can make this better. That's who I am as a person. And some of you knew my father and you either loved him or you hated him. There was no, there was no middle ground. But when I was 19 years old, he walked away from our family. He said, you don't make me happy anymore. I can't be here. And I was away at school and he called me on the phone and he said all the things he had to say. And if you've ever met me before, you know I have words. And so I had words and he was silent for a minute. And he said, but you're the one who's like me. I thought you of all people would understand. And I thought to myself, well, that changes this minute. Because if this is what being like you is, I want nothing to do with it. And so I decided that I would step onto somebody else's framework. That I would just, this framework was faulty, I was within my Amazon return window, and it was going back. Okay, so I found somebody else's framework that I had seen living a good, Jesus-following, biblical life, and I thought, I'll pick that one instead. And if you have ever met my mother or any of the women in my family, every single idea that you have is the best idea you've ever had in your entire life. <laughs> every single one. Oh my gosh, that's just so great. It's gonna be awesome. You're gonna be awesome. Can you imagine? Fast forward to 2023, Pastor Josh found this assessment, this personality assessment called Working Genius. Do you wanna know what my very lowest, lowest of low Working Genius is? The one that's comparable to words of affirmation. That's my lowest. I really wanna go, you're gonna be great, it's awesome. And that's what I got for you. I'm not built in that way. And so I was attempting to operate on this framework and it was like the clothes didn't fit. It was here I was and this didn't fit and it was itchy and I didn't like it and I couldn't do it and I wasn't successful at it. And I was trying to serve God in all the ways and I couldn't figure out why he wasn't blessing me in that moment. Why he wasn't blessing me in this space because I was trying and I was toiling. 
You know what my very largest working genius ones are? Making things better and toiling and making it being analytical and finding the holes in the spaces and knitting it all together. That's where I'm good. I didn't get that from my father. You didn't get that from that person who mishandled that framework. You got it from God himself. The Bible says that. And so just because you saw this mishandled, don't just toss it away, throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, "Mm mm-mm, that's too risky, I'm not gonna do it. Allow God to take your character in this moment and refine the person that you are to match that calling because the calling that you have requires the framework that you're built on. And so we have to really just submit to the process. And that process is really hard. That process doesn't necessarily feel good. And I think that's why some of us shy away from the very beginning. We really just want to be all in on something that's sunshine and rainbows all the time but that was not what was promised to us. I mean, honestly, if anything is promised to us, it's the opposite. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome this world. We're not promised that it's going to be easy to get to what our calling is and where God has called us to be. But what he's asking us to do is to submit to this place that he has placed us in right now, today. And what's really hard about that sometimes is we have sat with God and we've been with God and we've seen just a glimpse of what comes next. And so we sit where we are and we think to ourselves, God, this cannot be all that you have for me. This can't be it. I know that what you have for me, it's just It's so much more. You have more planned than this right now. But God is calling us to trust the process, be in the process, fully present, so that he can take that character and refine us to match our calling. And David gives us a really great example, biblically, of somebody who sat in the process and trusted the process And then God used that process to prepare him for that next step. And I love using David as an example because if God had grace for David, man, he can have grace for you because David was a disaster. He was a walking hot mess and God still continued to meet him exactly where he was. He was never too far gone to not be in the grace of God. And so we're going to start this morning in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. We're going to be introduced to the character of David. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man. And the Lord is with him. He is a warrior, and the Lord is with him. So the next time we're going to meet up with David, his oldest three brothers are now in battle against the Philistines. And what we know about David, based off what we just read, is he's a warrior. There had to be some part of David that wanted to be at battle with the warriors, And yet he wasn't at battle with the warriors. He was left behind to tend to his father's sheep. So we're going to pick up in verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephraimite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Elahib, the second Abdadab, and the third Shammah. Pause, their mother did not love them because there's no way that you give a child that you love dearly those three names. Continue. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. 
For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. The number 40 in the Bible, it's a a signal of trial and tribulation, and it's a lot of times put together with completion. So for 40 days, there was trial, there was tribulation. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah, or roasted grain, and then 10 loaves of bread for your brothers, and hurry to their camp. So here's David, he's a warrior. He really probably wants to be there. He wants to be in the next step of his calling. He's called to be a warrior, that's who he is, that's the framework that he's built on. So he wants to be there, but he's being kept far, far away. In the, with the sheep, nobody else to talk to in the hillsides. And that's where he's left. But then he's not just left there. He is called to go and be the DoorDash driver for his brother's lunch. So now not only does he have to watch from a faraway distance where possibly he could just do other things and not have to think about it, now he's got to go and see all those things and stand and watch those people that he wants to be fighting beside. He wants to be there with his brothers. Going down to verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. So what's been happening? Goliath comes out, he's like, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna try. Me, I'm the best warrior, and you bring your best warrior, and we'll go to battle, and whoever wins, wins. Come on, send your best warrior. And he's done this for 40 days, and the Israelite army has cowered in fear. So David gets there and he's like, seriously? Nobody's gonna do something about this? You're just gonna let him talk to us that way? So Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So David has been keeping his father's sheep. He's been refining this skill that he really probably didn't know he needed for this moment because how would he? We have the ability to see the end of the story, but David doesn't know what comes next. He just knows that he's been with the sheep and he's gotten pretty darn good with a sling and a stone. But in that time, he's also been with God. I know my God. I know that my God was with me when I fought the bear. I know that my God was with me when I fought that lion. I know that my God will be here. And so he has spent time knowing God so much that he knows the character of God. He's submitted, not just stood in, the process that God has put him in. And he has existed in the space and time that God has called him to be in without having any idea what the next step is. And so verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. 
As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down into the ground. So David has been preparing for this moment without knowing that he's been preparing for this moment the entire time that he's been keeping those sheep. And he said yes to God in the times when he didn't know how he was gonna make it to that calling that was up on the other side of the mountain. He just said yes. He said, this is what you've asked me to do. This is where I'm gonna meet you. And not only am I going to say yes grumpily, I'm gonna say yes and I'm going to delve into the character that is God and I'm gonna know you more in this place. Because that is the tricky thing about framework. One of the very first things, the very first thing, that we have record of Satan saying in the Bible is, did God really say? He says it to to Eve, Adam and Eve, he says it to Eve way back in the garden. Did God really say? Did God really say? And so we have this framework that God has built us on and the devil doesn't have to work as hard in 2023 as he did well back in David's day. It's a lot easier for, get, for him to get in and create a wedge between us and God because all he has to do is keep us distracted. And it's easy to do that here. And so here we are, and we know that this is our framework, but did God really say, I mean, he said that he built you like this. He said that this is the framework that he built you on. Did he really say that it wasn't okay for you to have a negative attitude all the time? Did he really say that you should be nicer in this place? Did he really say that you need to work on controlling your anger? Did he really say those things? Because what we end up doing is adding additions to our framework that God placed us on. And these additions aren't from God at all. And they don't enhance the framework that God gave us. They actually serve as a distraction and a detriment from who we're meant to be. Because God called us to be this person that is built in his image. And so that needs to be the lens that we look at when we say, hey, is this actually of God? Well, is it created in the image of God? Is it loving? Is it kind? Is it perfect? If those answers aren't yes, well, then we need to reassess if that framework is actually of God. Oh, well, you know, it's just, it's just how we do it. We're just, we're just realists. Well, God has called us to be realists. God, some of us, God has called us to be real about the situation that we're in. But that doesn't mean that our attitude when it's attached to that realism needs to be terrible. It means that God has called us to see the situation as it is and say, you know what? Here's what we're going to do to move forward from this. This is we're gonna pray and be in, in, in communion with God. And we're gonna take a step that is in line with his will for our lives. That's what God has called us to do with that realism. And you can apply that to anything that is in your life as well. God didn't create those parts of our framework that are just those little additions. And those additions don't align with the calling or the character of God himself. But verse 40 of what we just read has always caused me to pause a little bit. Verse 40, he leans down, he picks up five smooth stones. This is a really confident, cocky young man. Why is he picking up five smooth stones? He he thinks it's gonna take him five times? I mean, quite honestly, that would still be admirable. I don't know if I can slay this giant God, but I'm gonna do it for you anyways, and I'm gonna try my hardest. There's still, that's admirable. But it doesn't line up with the character of David that we have seen throughout this story but we do serve a very intentional God. And so if he put the number five in there for a reason, we're supposed to know as to why. And there is a reason. 
There is a reason why. And if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 21, we're going to start in verse 15. Before we start, there is a word, and it's Rapha, R-A-P-H-A. Bible scholars believe that Rapha is the proper name for the father of the giants. Okay? Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbi Benabab, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels and who was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zariah, came to David's rescue. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle so that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Sebekai the Hushatite killed Saph, one of the descendants of Rapha. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elanon, son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. In still another battle, which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in all. He was also descended from Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shammai, David's brother, killed him. These were four descendants of Rapha and Gath, and they all fell at the the hand of David and his men. Four men, plus Goliath. David didn't pick up five stones because he was worried about whether or not he was going to be able to take down Goliath. He picked up five stones because they lived an eye for an eye. Goliath had family that would come after him when he did. And there were four of them. And so when he picked up five stones, he picked up five stones because he was ready for the retribution of what was coming. He didn't come in and think, oh my gosh, I'm just, I'm so nervous. He knew the character of God. He'd spent time knowing the character of God. He said that my God is with me when I I was against that lion. My God was with me when I fought that bear, and I know that my God will be with me here. He knew the character of God because he had done the work. He had been in that place, and he had submitted to the place that God said him, and he said, I'm not going to leave here. This is hard, and I don't like it. But I'm going to stay anyways because this is where you have called to me to be in this moment. And I trust you enough to trust the process and trust who you are and know that when it's time, you're going to give me my next step. And when we get into trouble is when we try to figure out what that next step looks like all by ourselves. We don't consult God in the process and we're like, man, I f- we're going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to move. And I feel like all of heaven is against us in that process. Maybe it's because the timing isn't right. And all of heaven is probably a little bit against us in that process. Saying, hold on, wait a minute. I haven't opened that door yet. There's something for you in this place that I have put you. And I need you to... Take, say, make a yes, say yes to being in this place right now. Allowing me to just take that character and shape that character into who I need you to be to take that next step. And when the time comes, he's going to give us that next step. He has it planned out. We just have to be here. There's something for us here in the present. And when we're so focused on what comes in the future and what comes next and how I'm going to handle it when it does, we miss the opportunity for God to grow us here. And I can't speak for you. I can only speak for me. But what I can tell you is if God showed me years ago what was on the other side, what was at the top of the mountain that I would have associated with my calling and this is what it looks like, and he showed me every single step that would get me there. I think I would have looked at the process and I would have said, 
I don't actually think I want that. Because it's hard. And he never told us that life was going to be easy. His words actually say the opposite. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. It's hard. And we get into these valley places, and we're like, but this isn't what you promised, God. This isn't what's on the other side of your promise. Let's just get there. But if we closed our eyes, and I dream of Jeannie teleported to the other side, we wouldn't be ready for the place that God has in store for us. We wouldn't be ready, our character wouldn't match. We wouldn't have had the life experiences to really be solidly placed in that place. We need the process to get us there. And that's really hard to remember in those valleys. It's hard to remember in those times when it feels like you're not making any progress forward at all. But God allows us to sit in those valleys sometimes because life grows in the valley. That's where the water is. Life doesn't necessarily grow on the mountaintop. And when we take that and we, we apply it to our human heart, those mountaintop experiences, we need God there just as much as we do in the valleys. There's absolutely no debating that. But we forget there. We sometimes slip into a place where we've done it on our own and in our own power. But that's not true when we find ourselves in those valleys. When we find ourselves in those valleys, we connect to the character of God. We spend time with God. We're close enough to hear that still small whisper of God in those places saying, no, here, hold on. This is what we're going to do. And it's in those places of closeness that God gives us our next step. And he refines that character to be able to take it. Because the calling that he has on each and every one of us, yes, it's good. Yes, it's what we should stand in. Yes, it's a framework that we should be on, absolutely. But at the end of the day, we're built on these frameworks to glorify him. That's our calling at the end of the day, to bring glory to God. That's it. If you're looking for what's the meaning of life, that's it, in a nutshell. I have been put on this earth to bring glory to my Savior.